Welcome to Tax Savvy Financial and Charitable Planning with Jeffrey Froshman. We will be starting our program shortly. Please make yourself comfortable. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for Tax Savvy Financial and Charitable Planning with Jeffrey Froshman. Please note, today's webinar is being recorded. In a Zoom webinar, you will only be able to see and hear the presenters in today's event. Your video and audio will not be available during the webinar. Before we begin our program, we would like to review some Zoom housekeeping items with you. Throughout the program this evening, you will be able to chat with both the panelists and other attendees. If you would like to send a chat, click on the chat icon on the bottom of your Zoom toolbar as shown on the screen. You will have the option to chat the entire group or to chat just the panelists. Please keep all of the comments in the chat appropriate. Failure to do so may result in the host removing you from this webinar. At the end of today's program, there will be a Q&A session. You may ask questions at any time throughout the program, and they will be answered at the end of this program. To ask a question, you will need to click on the Q&A icon located on the bottom of your Zoom toolbar as shown on the screen. Live transcript is available during tonight's webinar. If you would like to turn on the closed captioning, please click on the live transcript icon on the bottom of your Zoom toolbar. Here, you will have the option to show subtitles and view the, whole, the full transcript. If you have the subtitles option turned on, you can click and hold the subtitles to move them around your Zoom screen. To turn off closed captioning, simply click the live transcript icon again and turn off the captioning. If you need assistance during our program, please email us at specialevents at csumb.edu. One of our event team members will be checking this email throughout the event to assist you. At this time, I would like to welcome Lizette Miles to the virtual stage. Lizette is the gift planner for CSUMB and she will be your MC for today's event. Please give a warm welcome to Lizette. Thank you, Susan. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I see that we have wonderful participation with more than 30 attendees, and we've already received comments and greetings. Thank you for those. As a reminder, we will be emailing you the slide presentation and link to the webinar recording soon after this event, so there's no need to take notes, 
but feel free to jot down questions and comments and submit them in the Q&A. I'd like to thank and recognize our co-hosts from the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, Director Michelle Crompton, and from KAZU General Manager Mick Benedict and Membership Director Noelle Freitas. For the past several years, we've been co-hosting plan giving events, mainly on the topic of estate planning. This year, we selected a slightly different topic, tax savvy financial and charitable planning. Here is the agenda for our time together. We will hear from Jeffrey Froshman, followed by the Q&A. Throughout this webinar, Noelle, Michelle, and I will be monitoring your questions and comments in the Q&A, and I will ask the questions to our presenter. Now I'm pleased to introduce to you our presenter. Jeffrey Froshman is a distinguished lecturer in the College of Business at Cal State Monterey Bay. The university officially gave him this designation in 1998. This past January, he became the first College of Business professor to receive a 25 year anniversary pin. His tax career began as an IRS revenue agent. After receiving his MBA in 2000, Jeff opened his second, he, he, um, in taxation, he became a CPA in 1981 and opened his own firm. In 2000, Jeff opened his second business, an investment advisory firm. In 2010, he ended that phase of his professional life and began another, working with a major brokerage wirehouse as a financial consultant. Jeff is an active certified financial planner and a retired CPA. He is also a founding member and former chairperson of the College of Business Dean's Advisory Council. Please join me in welcoming Jeffrey Froshman. Well, hello, vast viewing audience. Thank you so much for being here and joining us. There's nothing I enjoy more personally than talking about tax savvy financial and charitable planning. It's the stuff that dreams are made of. So what we're gonna do is um, kind of go through a, a few slides here uh, do a little Q&A, hopefully uh, entertain you, have you learn something, and uh, we'll have a marvelous presentation, and I'm looking forward to giving it. So if we can jump to the, our first official slide, please. So there's, there's a couple of ways to talk about uh, tax and financial planning topics. Uh, we could do a, a textbook approach where uh, I would like lecture my students, and we would have a book, and we'd have some PowerPoints, and we'd have some notes, and uh, it, it can get rather dry, but you know, it's part of the learning process. We try to do interaction, but the way we're going to do uh, this presentation is I'm going to treat you as if I were the expert witness, and you are my judge and jury, which means that I, I've got to kind of start with some basic information, get everybody kind of acclimated to our topic, then get a little bit more advanced. And as we get to our conclusion, go a little uh, into a little complexity. And I, I kind of refer to this as peeling the onion. So uh, I'm trying not to give you many tears as we get down and down deeper into the onion, but uh, try to get you into a uh, position where everything's kind of flowing really smoothly for you. So next slide, please. Well, we're going to start off um, with the basic information. And um, our basic information is that cash donations are tax deductible. And donations here can be made with cash, with check, or with uh, credit cards. But um, this will be the first of uh, many different uh, topics we'll discuss where we have uh, our basic rule. We'll have a general rule, and if there's a general rule, there's going to be exceptions to the general rule. So what are these limitations? Well, it depends if uh, on your tax return you take a standard deduction or if you do an itemized deduction. But you can't do both. So uh, if you take a standard deduction, there's no itemizations. And I make that real clear to my students, and I'm just emphasizing that to, to you, a, a, a more mature audience who might have some more experience filing tax returns. So what are the rules? If it's a cash donation, 
Uh, if you take a standard deduction, it's basically a $300 uh, donation uh, deduction you can still have. So that means for married filing jointly up to $600. Uh, so $300 per person. So next slide, please. So uh, what is this so-called standard deduction? Well, these are the amounts that uh, pretty much every individual is allowed to have as a deduction against their gross income, and it depends on their filing status. So uh, I've listed here single, married filing separately, married filing jointly, head of household standard deductions, and there's an additional standard deduction if you are 65 or older and are legally blind. But if your itemized deductions are greater than the standard deduction, then you would, of course, itemize deductions. Next slide, please. So if you do itemize deductions, your itemized deductions might also be limited. So what is that limitation? Well, in general, the charitable contribution deduction cannot exceed 60% of your adjusted gross income. And in some cases that we'll talk about shortly, lower limits may apply. But we have a very, very nice exception per our CARES Act. And that is for the year 2021, this year, the limit is 100% of AGI. So whatever your adjusted gross income is, you may have an itemized deduction of charitable donations at 100% of AGI. So this is a one year rule only that will expire at the end of this year. So there may be some incentive to accelerate itemized deductions with, uh, with charities involved. Next slide. Well, we talked about cash donations, but what about non-cash donations or donations of uh, property? So if you donate property, typically property will either have decreased in value or increased in value from the time you purchase it. So let's first talk about property that has decreased in value. And this very commonly could be items that are given to goodwill. This is what uh, many, many individuals are familiar with, uh, having some items that are, that are taken to uh, a place similar to goodwill. And uh, we have an example here that is clothing. And uh, the clothing deduction is going to be the property's fair market value at the time the donation is made. So please pay attention that the fair market value is not what you paid for it if the property has decreased in value. So it's the lesser of the two amounts. Okay, next slide. And we have now left the very basic rules and we're gonna step into the more advanced items. And where this begins is if property has increased in value. So first there's a general rule. And the general rule is the amount of the deduction is the fair market value of the property at the time of the contribution. And that's the same rule we saw for property that has decreased in value. So the amount of the deduction is the fair market value of the property at the time of the contribution. But that's the general rule. So if there's a general rule, there's going to be an exception or two or three or 20 exceptions to the general rule. So how do we show you all this? We created more slides for you. So let's go ahead to the next one, please. All right, we have a major exception for what's called capital gain property. So what is capital gain property? It's appreciated property that if it's sold at its fair market value, instead of being a donation, that would yield a long-term capital gain. So what's a long-term capital gain? That includes assets that have been held more than one year. Not one year, but more than one year. I can't even begin to tell you how many people I picked up over the years as new income tax clients when I had my CPA practice, because when they prepared their own tax return 
And at the time, perhaps uh, there wasn't a smart program behind the scenes prompting them on, they would sell property at exactly one year and think it was long-term capital gain. They'd get their nice notice from the IRS saying, I think you made a mistake here, that short-term gain, which is ordinary income and taxed at a higher rate. So again, capital gain property is appreciated property that you have held more than one year. So ordinary income property is appreciated property that's not capital gain property, which means you held it one year or less. Then the deductible amount is going to be what you paid for the property, not its appreciated fair market value. So when you give uh, to your favorite charities property that has appreciated, you wanna make sure that you have held it more than one year. Next slide. Now we do have some special limitations on donations of capital gain property. So the main factor here is that the deduction cannot exceed 30% of adjusted gross income. So let's take a look at an example. A taxpayer has a $100,000 adjusted gross income and they were fortunate to buy some stock. They've held the stock more than one year and it is appreciated to $50,000 and they make the donation to their favorite charity with this appreciated stock. Well, it's a $50,000 donation but they're limited to 30% of their adjusted gross income, which would be $30,000. So what happens to the rest of this deduction? Is it lost? And we have more slides. So next slide, please. No, it's not lost. We have carryovers of contributions to future years. So if you cannot deduct the amount in the current year due to the AGI limit, you may carry this over in time. And the carryover is going to be for the next five tax years until the deduction is used up, but not beyond five years. So you have the current year and you have five succeeding years to absorb the income tax write-off. However, if that carryover cannot be used during that five-year period, any remaining unused deduction is indeed lost. So I just wanna point out again that for capital gain contributions, that is a 30% AGI limit, not the 100%, which is the general rule for cash contributions. Next slide, please. Boy, a lot of us like volunteering our time, don't we? So we donate our time to our favorite charitable causes. So what happens if you donate time? Well, your time is valuable. It's valuable to you, your family, maybe your coworkers, but there is no tax deduction for the value of time worked or services rendered. Probably most of you realize that. If I said something different, I'd be getting all sorts of attention but uh, that is our rule. Time and services rendered are wonderful. I encourage it. I know a lot of you have done it as I have as well, but there is no tax write-off for, for that. Next slide, please. Well, we have authorities out there that may want to audit tax returns. And if you're audited by either the IRS or the Franchise Tax Board or some other state's equivalent of our Franchise Tax Board, there's going to be substantiation requirements. So what are these requirements? So if the donation is less than $250 for cash, a cancel check or receipt will be just fine. But if your donation is $250 or more, you do need a receipt or letter from the qualified charitable organization that describes date, amount, and that famous verbiage that says no other goods or services were provided in exchange for the donation. 
Once again, these are cash donations and how things are substantiated. Next slide, please. Well, what happens if you donate property, you donate a vehicle, or you donate any type of non-cash uh, items? Well, the substantiation requirement for non-cash donations will vary, and it varies depending upon the amount of the donation. So if the donation is less than $250, get and keep a receipt. If it's $250, but not more than $500, get a written acknowledgement. Fine line there between the two. Over $500, but not more than $5,000, get the written acknowledgement and file a special IRS form that will have the items listed and proof from the IRS standpoint that this is a valid donation between $500 and $5,000. And if it's over $5,000, you need a written acknowledgement, you need the special IRS form, and you need to obtain a qualified written appraisal. All right, so that qualified written appraisal is very important for these larger, defined by 5, 000, over $5,000 of donations. Next slide, please. So we've walked our way through some of the basic rules. We've walked our way through some of the more advanced rules. Now let's kind of look at some of the more complex areas here. And so what we're gonna go into are qualified charitable distributions, which to some of you, you're experienced with. And we're gonna talk about uh, some charitable trusts. So next slide. The Qualified Charitable Distribution, QCD. This was a fabulous uh, new law that took effect a couple of years ago. So this was targeted for individuals who are over 70 and a half years old and they have to take a required minimum distribution from their IRA account. So we have QCDs, RMDs, IRAs. So it's the whole uh, initial vocabulary that uh, all of you are familiar with, whether it be your line of work or whether it be any kind of jargon that, uh, that uh, might be up in your lifetime that we all just thoroughly enjoy. But here we have QCDs, qualifying or individuals over 70 and a half years old, they may donate up to $100,000 from their IRA assets to charity annually. And if they do this, they do not have to report that distribution as taxable income. And the whole idea of the QCD was to meet those required minimum distributions that were an effect for people 70 and a half years old that were required to take money from their traditional individual retirement account. Now, we did have a change of rule fairly recently on the SECURE Act. Now, the SECURE Act was assigned on the 20th of December, 2019. And per the SECURE Act, if your 70th birthday is July 1st of 2019 or later, you need not take RMD withdrawals until you reach age 72. But the QCD rules were not changed. You can still do QCD as long as you're over 70 and a half years old. But the new RMD rules are for 72. In fact, in committee right now, there's talk about raising that. I, I've read about uh, maybe up to age 75, but uh, all that of course is just reading and leaks that come out of different committee reports. And until uh, we have a act passed by Congress, signed by the president, what you're seeing on the screen is what the law is. Now QCDs are wonderful planning tools, um, especially for individuals that do not itemize their deductions, especially for individuals that take the standard deduction. 
So here you can meet your required minimum distribution by donating to your favorite charity. And you don't have to report that income as taxable. And you get to make the donation to your favorite charity and still take a maximum standard deduction that you're entitled to. So it's really a win, 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 win situation with the QCDs. Next slide, please. So now I'm gonna talk a, a little bit about uh, charitable trusts. And there's a charitable lead trust, charitable annuity trust, charitable remainder trust, uh, all different acronyms involved there. But what I wanna talk about now is what is a charitable remainder trust? And uh, please keep in mind, this is a little bit more on the complex side, but hopefully it'll flow very nicely for you on the slides here. All right, let's go to the next slide, please. Charitable remainder trusts are C or CRTs, and they are used to avoid paying tax on the sale of highly appreciated property. So I wanted to put an example together to kind of illustrate how this would work. And of course, be around to answer any questions somebody might have on CRTs. So let's say that many years ago in a galaxy, well, okay, on planet Earth, a taxpayer purchases a ranch for $600,000. That ranch now has a fair market value of $6 million. So if sold, the federal and California taxes on the $5.4 million gain would be a little bit more than $1,400,000. And FYI, Congress is thinking about increasing capital gains taxes. So this amount could be much higher and it could be much higher fairly soon. What to do? What do we do here? And the answer is we consider using a charitable remainder trust. Next slide, please. So how does a CRT work? So let's use our example of a $6 million property with a cost basis of $600,000. How this would work is as follows. Before the property is sold, we transfer the property into the charitable remainder trust. The CRT sells the property, but since this is a charitable trust, there's no income tax due on the sale. So after some selling expenses, the CRT is now has about 5.6 million in cash. And I'm assuming in my example here that there is no mortgage or liability attached to the property. So with that cash, the CRT then invests in a diversified portfolio of equities and fixed income. And uh, you, you lay folks might call equities and fixed income stocks and bonds. But uh, in the profession, we refer to it as equities and fixed income. All right, so the trust agreement rule would require that the CRT distribute 5% of the trust value to the original property owners each year. So what we're trying to do here is create a tax-free sale where 100% of the cash is available to invest. And then per the terms of how charitable remainder trusts work, the owner or owners of the CRT usually get, and again, there's some complex roles here, but they'll usually get 5% of the trust value each year for distribution. Now, that annual distribution that comes from the trust assets, which are liquid assets now, is taxable income to the owners. So that's part of uh, taxable income potentially, and in most cases, it's part of retirement income for someone. When the owners pass away, the remaining principal does go to their favorite charities. And again, this is all in the trust agreement. So you can list your favorite charities. 
and that's revocable. So well, as long as you're alive, if uh, for some reason you wanna change out of a charity or add charities, you have the ability to do that. But wait, there's more. So let us go to the next slide, please. Well, since the CRT principle, which is the appreciated property, eventually will go to charity upon owner or owner's final passings. I mean, everyone has to have passed away. The original owner will get a charitable tax deduction right now for the present value of the future donation of the property that's going to charity. So in our example here, let's just make an assumption that the present value of the CRT is 30%. So there's $5.6 million in the CRT. Multiply that by 30%. And this is again part of, uh, it's all part of uh, how old the, uh, the, the people are when they do all this. But let's use 30%. And that means they have a potential tax deduction now of $1,680,000. Now we have a couple things to remember here. Because this donation to the charitable remainder trust is a donation from the sale of capital gain property, this deduction is limited to 30% of AGI. And if the current year deduction is limited by 30% of AGI, the original owners of the property do have that five year carryover to take the unused portion against future income. So there is the current year and five years, six total years to absorb that wonderful tax deduction. So in summary, what have we done? We've sold property that was highly appreciated, paid no income tax on it. The money goes into a charitable trust. So at the passing of both or one or both parties, there's no estate tax involved, no death tax involved. And we've created a full income stream to our owners of the trust, and they get a tax deduction for doing all this. You think anybody might be potentially unhappy by having anything, uh, everyone doing this uh, wonderful tax savings? And the answer is, yeah, we may have some heirs that have been disinherited going, what about me? What about me? What happened? You just gave away $6 million. Well, maybe <laughs> that's what the, uh, the owners wanted to do. But if they want to preserve an inheritance, we will talk islet. Yes, you heard me right, islet. Go ahead to the next slide, please. The islet, the irrevocable insurance trust. And so it combines an insurance policy with a charitable remainder trust. So the insurance policy, if married, is a second to die policy. Of course, if it's a single person, you know, the policy is on their one life. And the insurance policy pays out to the, quote, disinherited, unquote, heir or heirs after both owners have passed away. And in the irrevocable life insurance trust, the insurance proceeds are completely free of both income taxes and estate taxes, death taxes. So an islet is pretty complex, especially working with a charitable remainder trust. You know, I've given you here a uh, maybe a 120 second snippet on something that's going to be a little bit more complex to get to the bottom of how all this works. So if these ideas are of interest to you, do not attempt to try these things at home on your own. So you'll need, and I have uh, four points here, and you notice the common word on those four points is experienced. So an experienced estate attorney, a life insurance agent or broker, a CPA, a financial advisor. You need a team to make all this work but when it works, it works just beautifully. Next slide, please. 
Well, that's the end of what I hope was a smooth presentation. Of course, you're, you're my judge and jury and you have to render the final verdict. But um, there's one final item I have to do here. And um, when I was preparing all this, my retired librarian spouse said, Jeff, get that bibliography. So here it is, sort of. You can go to IRS Publication 526 and find some nice reading on this topic. Um, I happen to know a lot because I've worked on these in my career a number of times. And lastly, to my special consultant, my PowerPoint guru, Professor Gary Schneider. Because when I started putting my slides together and I said, I have a few simple questions I wanna ask. He who knows me very well said, just give it to me, I'll do it. It'll be faster than explaining it to you. So Gary, I, I tip my uh, hat to you if I was wearing it right now and thank you. Next slide, please. And this is our ta-da moment. So um, thank you for hearing me, listening to me and I'll turn it back over to our uh, host and moderator and see if there's any uh, questions that you might have. Thank you, Jeffrey. What a wonderful presentation. I love the way that you talked about um, gifts going from simple to advanced to more complex. Like many universities, CSUMB has a robust plan giving program and we have benefited greatly from these types of gifts. In fact, last year, as we celebrated our 25th anniversary and the successful conclusion of our first ever comprehensive fundraising campaign, Planned gifts comprised a significant portion of the campaign. And now we are opening the virtual floor to questions and comments. So the first question that I have, and this one's from me, um, a lot of these concepts and a lot of these examples seem a little too good to be true. Um, it is legal and what, why is the government providing incentives for people to give? Well, it's a multi-layer answer to that. Um, who writes the tax laws? Congress. Does Congress, Congress have any influencers outside? Uh, yes, uh, we have uh, lobbyists, we have uh, large donors, um, we have uh, friends of our people that are in, in Congress. And we just got through with, uh, what, a few days ago, doing a little bit of uh, reading about maybe 2025 of our wealthiest Americans and what percentage of income tax they pay in proportion to their uh, wealth and their income. Uh, of course, as a professional, like any professional, I read that and not only know how they do it, understand why they do it. And if it's perfectly legal, why wouldn't you not do it? But all this, while it may be too good to be true, these are advanced estate planning and income tax planning techniques. And they are out there to um, clearly help certain people, individuals to uh, keep wealth. And uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, so uh, whether it be uh, accountants who can recognize this, maybe first and foremost, financial advisors, eventually the estate attorneys and the experienced uh, life agents that uh, work with uh, life insurance trusts, uh, it's all out there and, and free to be used. And this is just one technique out of several to kind of piggyback on your question, Lisette, that uh, individuals of a certain income and wealth category are, are free to use. Yeah, so you had also mentioned the qualified charitable distribution. So that's something that most people that are in their, their 70s would be able to take advantage of. So um, I wanted to ask a little bit more about that because I've got several questions. And one is, um, the source of the, the, um, the, the donation that needs to be a traditional IRA? Is that the... Well, to get the maximum tax advantage out of this, 
you would want to use a traditional uh, IRA because it's only the traditional IRA that's subject to the required minimum distribution. Mm -hmm. So if it doesn't come from a traditional IRA, it must come from a Roth IRA, which is a completely different type of, of investment and retirement plan. And if you meet the requirements of a Roth IRA, you can take any distribution you want. It's completely tax-free. And then of course, from there, you can make your donation or, or not. But to get the full benefit, the QCDs were meant specifically for traditional IRAs. So what if like, um, like I have a retirement account with my, um, my employer. So can I convert to an, uh, an IRA? a traditional IRA? You have a retirement account with your employer. So chances are, unless the plan allows you, the chances are the plan is not going to allow you to take money from that while you're still working with your employer. You need what's called separation of service, which means I'm gone. <laughs> I'm not there. I quit. You're fired. You know, all those kind of separation of service. Then you have a choice that you can do what's called a rollover or a transfer into an individual retirement account. That's great. So once I'm retired, then I have that option to convert to a tra traditional IRA, and then I'd be able to take advantage of the, the QCD. Yeah, then you would have that choice to make. Yes. Okay. All right. So the other question that has been coming up is about. Um, the, the money can be distributed to a qualified charitable organizations. What about donor advised funds? I'd heard that um, somebody was wondering if that they're eligible. Well, going from a QCD to a donor advised fund, I actually haven't heard that one before. Um, It certainly can be done because the donor advice fund is not a charitable type trust. So it can go into that donor advice fund because you would be taking normally after tax dollars anyway to put into a donor advice fund. And here you're just doing the same funding through the QCD distribution. Okay. And I have another question about um, how have required minimum distributions changed? Well, uh, two, two part answer there. The first part how they've changed is that the age from 70 and a half has been lifted to 72, you know, as was pointed out. But the second part that didn't get into my PowerPoints that uh, doesn't get much to the public is that the mortality tables uh, are now being changed. And those mortality tables mean that uh, the power of the federal government, uh, you're actually going to uh, live a little bit longer, which yeah. means the percentage that comes out of the IRA every year is a little bit smaller. Mm -hmm. Fine tuning, fine tuning, but that's the two part answer to your question. Okay. All right, we have a question about uh, someone would like to talk a little bit more about ILET. Um, using the ranch situation, can the heirs of the ranch use a charitable remainder trust to avoid estate tax, assuming the step-up basis is eliminated and or the estate limit is lowered under Biden administration? All right. I understood all that. The perp one of the purposes of the charitable remainder trust to be set up is to avoid the capital gains tax. Mm -hmm. So the property gets transferred into the trust. And once it gets transferred to the trust for the owner of the trust, that is out of the estate now. Now the purpose of the charitable remainder trust is that the principal at the time of death of the owner goes to charity. And again, it's not part of the estate. The irrevocable life insurance trust comes in to attempt to replenish a potential lost inheritance. And when the islet is put together correctly, and trust me, there's a lot of rules involved to make all this happen. When the islet's put together correctly, 
when the when the person eventually the owner of the policy uh, eventually dies or the insured eventually dies that money that goes into the islet is also income tax and estate tax free for the beneficiaries so it's not a meshing of the two it's like each individual entity or trust has those tax free components All right, here's another one. Can you use one of the charitable trusts to create an income stream using a primary residence property and also claim deductions whereby no taxes would be owed? Yeah, a sale of a residence has its own very specific rules, but a sale of a residence is capital gain property. Mm -hmm. It's only because of those specific rules that we you know, we look at the fact that um, there can be some exclusion from income depending on the marital status of the persons or persons selling the residence. But there is no regulation or rule that prohibits putting a personal residence into the trust, selling it, because if the residence is very highly appreciated, we have the same situation again. It completely uh, avoids the uh, income tax and it's removed from the estate. Now, does that answer the, the question or did I miss a part? I think so. I think what they were wondering about is um, when they say it, sale, sell, sell it, then, then that could then be deducted. So it would be a, a zero um, payment of, of taxes. At least that's the way that I interpreted it. And I, I think that you answered it. Well, the, the one thing that you mentioned that perks my professional ears up is deducted. And so the deduction is going to be whatever the CRT uh, charitable donation would percentage would be, mm -hmm. you know, what that percentage is. My example, I used a 30% present value. Uh, it gets a little bit more precise than that, again, depending on the facts and circumstances. Yeah, I think that that was answered. So let's see. And then... These are a little bit different questions than my students ask. <laughs> they want to know what's on the test, you know, that's... Uh, that's, that's a typical question. Here's one from somebody you know, but I won't, I won't uh, let you know who it is, but maybe you'll know by the question. Um, he says, excellent presentation and great slides. Please explain a bit more about islets. Are there any time limits? Does the beneficiary receive a lump, a lump sum? Okay. Well, that could be one of many people. You know, I've, I've got a wide, Variety. A lot of people I pay money to to say nice things to me. So, uh, you know, non tax deductible payments, I might add. Okay, so um, if you set up an islet, first of all, you need all those professionals sort of as your teammates to put it together. But what makes the islet really work is the life insurance. So, you need to buy a policy that can be funded either through a lump sum payment or it can be done through premium payments. And so premium payments would be the periodic payments, typically annually, that fund a life insurance policy, or you can uh, just do a lump sum and do it that way. And again, it just depends on the uh, individual or the couple's uh, financial circumstances. Okay, I think that, let's see here. Here's a question. If we have no check receipts, how much true cash can we say we gave to charities on our tax returns? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's one of the uh, favorite questions that uh, I, I saw when I looked at some of the attendees out there. We do have some professional uh, CPAs and tax preparers out there. In other words, the, you know, the, what that is called, Lisette, is how much can I get away with? And um, I mean, right? And we, if I don't have any receipts and stuff, what, what's this limit before somebody uh, checks? Well, you're right until proven wrong. So let's just say that uh, there, there's specific rules that I, I quickly laid out. And um, unless the IRS or the franchise tax board comes in and says, show me, prove it to me, you're right till proven wrong, which means you can't prove it right. 
Well, and I think a lot of charities, at least I know that here at CSUMB, we, we do a good job of receiving. So even if you don't have a copy of your check, then you might have a copy of the documentation that we would provide. That we All right, let me, let me add to that as well, because, you know, I, I'd like to say I, I have been a recipient of many of the CSUMB's fine letters as proof of a tax deduction. So uh, thank you for all that fine work. Barbara Zappas, if you're out there, you, you, your, your team does a fabulous job. Um, yeah, what, what happens with the proof is that um, you, you have, there can't be any goods or services exchanged for it. I mean, we, we, we know that, I kind of pointed that out. And the canceled check for larger donations isn't valid um, because there was a court case that came out a number of years ago, and I'll, I'll summarize it for you briefly. This was a number of years ago, but an individual was audited and they had um, a big canceled check. Remember back in the days when there was canceled checks for this uh, charitable donation. Well, what had happened when there was further investigation is this person was responsible for passing the hat around at the uh, service and collected all the cash, put all the cash in uh, their pocket, wrote a check out to make sure that the charitable institution wasn't shorted. And of course, there was all these 52 canceled checks that uh, totaled up to be the tax deduction. And that's when Congress got wind of that court case and came up with the law that said, a canceled check on these larger donations will not work. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. I think we answered that one. We have a question um, about the sale of a primary residence. If the, the question is, if you exceed the 500,000 cap gain exclusion, can you do a partial sale as your primary residence and transfer the amount that exceeds the exclusion to a CRT? I've not come across that before. Typically, it's a, you know, you're going to put your residence in or you're not, you're going to put property in or you're not going to put property in. Um, I, I've never seen it manipulated that, uh, you know, the numbers work out on both cases. So in that respect, um, I'm going to say probably not, but I don't know what the official answer is to that. Yeah, that one seems kind of tricky to me. You need to research. And that, that underscores the importance of uh, talking with your various advisors on, on this. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Here's a question. For a single person who is leaving everything to charity upon death, what would be a good arrangement to maximize what goes to the charity? Yeah, uh, a single person leaving everything to charity. Um, you would you, you would probably want to make sure that your final instructions, and again, I'll let the attorneys out there decide whether that's their will or their uh, trust. You know, that's that's not my uh, that's not my expertise, but it spells out who gets what very specifically, name of the organization, typically the address of the organization. As long as you're alive, it's revocable. So, uh, and then if you want to uh, let people know uh, in the charitable division that you're being in the uh, last will or trust, um, if you want the recognition for that, that's uh, available to you. Technically, you haven't given them anything other than a piece of paper of a current will or trust that says this, of which they could pull that plug anytime they wanted to and do something different. But mm -hmm. um, it, it's an expanded answer to your question, which is as long as it's laid out in a will or trust, that, that's the final instructions. Mm -hmm. There's no other special item if it's all going to go to charity. Yeah. Well, and a lot of it will depend on what sort of assets they have, but um, because there can be some that can go. Um, be designated with outside of a will or, or a trust, but a trust or all comprehensive can be. So um, yeah, that would that sounds good. That answered live. Let's see. Um, okay. I have some other ones. Um, I wanted, I, I had a question about appreciated stock. Um, 
So say that you have an appreciated stock, you wanna be as charitable as possible, you usually do a cash donation, but you wanna keep your stock, even though you could you know, uh, sell your, you could donate your appreciated um, um, stock that you owned for more than a year. <laughs> um, so what, what are some of the, the investment uh, or investment management uh, advice that you would have for someone that wanted to be as charitable as possible and possibly use um, a, a stock? Yeah, um, that's why you brilliantly named this topic tax savvy financial and charitable giving, huh? Um, the, the, the first case I ever came across in my career was highly appreciated stock. Um, this was back in the days that, um, see, I, I can remember the case too. It was back in the days that um, uh, Sun Microsystems was a uh, fledgling company. And it's, Sun Microsystems, by the way, was subsequently uh, taken over, bought out by Oracle. But um, for a while, it was a major, major player in Silicon Valley. And uh, Sun Microsystems became known to the world when, when AT&T, little company you might have heard of, bought a major share of, of the stock of Sun Microsystems. And all of a sudden, we had our first group of uh, people who were in a startup that were now a multi-millionaires holding Sun Microsystems stock. So uh, my client was one of these and it came in with a cost basis of like three cents a share and it's now worth $20 a share and they had, you know, tens of thousands of, of shares of stock and um, realized they had enough to do what they wanted to, you know, life planning. Um, they were happy, but they also wanted to give back. So uh, they wanted to make some donations to their favorite charities. Now, in this particular case, they had two choices. I could say, why don't you sell these shares, pay tax on it, take the net amount and donate it, which would be the cash. But if you're gonna give, give something to your favorite charity and you have this ability, just donate the stock. There's no tax that you have to pay and you get the full write-off because you've held it more than a year of the fair market value. So that was the first case I came across and I came across quite a number of uh, my career evolved in Silicon Valley of these kind of um, donations. Uh, the second one that um, came across was some huge numbers and that was my first experience with a charitable remainder trust. And at that point, I was all theory and no practice. So with an experienced team, the client brought in, I was able to you know, learn on the spot, meaning I knew what the rules were, but you always remember sort of your first time. And the first time here was with a client who had very highly appreciated stock and a lot of it. And they wanted to have an income stream because at their stage in their life, they were in their late fifties and they wanted the income from the charitable grander trust. Then as time went on, I had clients with a highly appreciated property. Uh, the ranch property that I gave was sort of a similar thing that I had uh, in real life, as far as people who um, started a business years ago, real property, land, wanted to have an income stream, put it in the trust, and the same example that I gave uh, to all of you during this presentation. Great, thank you. We've got another question that has come in, and that is, or, and it might be a combination of a question and comment. Uh, Making nonprofits the beneficiaries of your retirement accounts is a very easy, meaning no lawyer needed, and is uh, tax free to the charity. I think this is also this also works with life insurance policies. I well, let's see a couple of ways I can interpret that. First of all, any uh, monies that pass from an IRA. That goes back to your earlier comment, Lissette. That goes outside of probate. That's a direct. Uh, uh, that's direct to the beneficiary. So it does not to be need, does not need to be in your will or trust. It's on the instructions of the retirement plan. Mm -hmm. Now, life insurance is a different uh, different beast. If the life insurance proceeds go to an individual, it's part. It's potentially part of a taxable estate. The proceeds themselves are not taxed to the beneficiary but it is part of the taxable estate of the decedent. Mm -hmm. However, if the beneficiary of the policy, and remember there can be multiple beneficiaries, whatever amount goes directly to a charitable institution, that is not part of the taxable estate. So that'll pass tax-free, estate tax-free. All right. 
let's see here. Um, So I wanted to ask a little bit more about um, uh, life income gifts. Um, and specifically, if you didn't want to go to the complexity of a charitable remainder trust, could you talk a little bit about a charitable gift annuity? Yeah, charitable gift annuities are certainly not as complex as a, uh, a charitable remainder trust. And here what happens is you make the donation right to the qualified uh, organization, whether it be um, uh, your, your, your favorite XYZ, CSUMB, and a gift annuity, what that'll do is depending on the age of the uh, donor, they'll get an income stream back a certain percentage for the rest of their lives. And so that's how a gift annuity would work. Yeah, those have been very popular at at CSUMB. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. All right, so I have another question. They say, I'm not sure if this falls under today's topic, but can you explain IL, uh, IULs, indexed universal life insurance policy? It is sometimes referred to as a rich man's Roth IRA. Um. Yeah, I, uh, I, I can talk about that. It is definitely outside the scope uh, of this. So I, I think, um, I mean, I, I, I teach the, the new risk management insurance course that's gonna be offered next semester. And um, this is a little bit, uh, it, it, it is mainstream in the insurance world, but it's not necessarily mainstream for our topic today. So I think I'm gonna pass on that and yeah. I, it just would not hold a lot of interest, I think, for folks right now. All right, let's see here. A question, can you donate funds from charitable trusts to a nonprofit where you work? Can I donate funds from a charitable trust to a nonprofit where I work? Mm -hmm. Now, if it's a charitable remainder trust, those dollars won't go to the nonprofit until after the individual has passed away. Because again, it's a remainder trust. So um, I'm, I'm not sure what the, if that's the right answer to the question that was just asked. I don't know if that's what the meaning of the person asking the question is yeah. about. Yeah, I, I think that there for charitable trusts, then usually the there is a, a charity that's a uh, benefits from it, either um, a lead trust in the beginning or um, a right. Right, a lead trust would be like flipping it over. Yeah, that the yeah. income right yeah. now, the current income would go right to the charity, and the the, the death of the um, of the of the principal, then the uh, that goes right back to the estate. It right. um, doesn't go to the charity. But if you take the annual distribution from the charitable remainder trust, which is income, then you can take that as well as anything else and donate that to a nonprofit where yeah. yeah yeah okay again nonprofit would be a technical uh, term but a 501c3 organization it has to be not just any nonprofit it has to be a tax approved uh, uh, nonprofit or charity mm -hmm. okay so you had talked about, and I think that this is so great that even if you do a standard deduction, then you can take a $300 yeah, uh, yeah. write off mm -hmm. and $600 if you do a, a joint uh, tax return. Um, so can you take that $300 and spread it amongst different charities or does it need to be $300 to one charity? Oh, nice question. No, thanks for asking that, whoever asked it. Uh, you can spread it over as many charities as you wish. It does not have to go to one specific uh, charitable organization. Right. And so um, some of these uh, that are not the, you know, writing out the check or paying with a credit card, they might require a little bit more advanced planning um, up front, but uh, so um, what what would you suggest as far as people to plan to make sure that they'd be able to get their donation in by the end of the, the year or when they would need to, to get credit for it? Yeah, yeah. 
this has happened to me personally. You want to make sure that you do this. Uh, you do it well before December 31st. Um, <laughs> Because <laughs> the time the, everything gets back, the letter or what if it's done by check or if it goes into a, a the, the nonprofit or the charitable uh, brokerage account, um, you may have a different tax year involved. So yeah, the golden rule is if you were planning on doing this and you have the capital to do it, uh, do it now, please. Just just do it and make sure there's plenty of time that you can get your proper documentation in order and don't wait till the last minute. Mm -hmm. So um, I have one more question. So if there's anybody that uh, would like to ask another question, then please go ahead and answer that, uh, put that in the question and answer. Um, and the question that I'll now ask is, where do I go to learn more? Or who do I go to to give me some advice? Okay. <clears throat> so when we say learning more, um, uh, we can take that very broadly to what we just referred to here. Uh, each topic that I brought up has its own separate uh, reading materials and lessons involved. So it just depends on how deep you want to peel that onion. Uh, as I mentioned in my bibliography, uh, that IRS publication will give you some nice general reading that will enhance what I've talked about here. But you can always go into, uh, just as an example, you can go into some of these you know, dummies books on financial planning. Um, there, are many art, there are many different books, of course, on finances. You can go, go online to any of the, uh, you know, just Google the topic and uh, you'll have more than you know what to do with. Um, Textbooks are really good, but they're also really expensive. So that would probably be the last resort. And there's just all sorts of articles, professional journals. Uh, there's just a whole treasure trove of uh, places one can go to read or watch a YouTube video on, uh, on all sorts of topics as well. So if you want to know about uh, puts and calls and margins and all the fun stuff financial planners do, go to YouTube and find one and you'll get yourself a nice uh, 20 minute uh, dissertation. So th there's lots of places to go to. Well, the more I learn about this, these topics, the more I understand why there, we, it's so wonderful that we can go to experts that, that have all this learning. Um, so I really appreciate those, those types of people. And you've worked in taxes and then you've also done the investment management side. So for with taxes, then when is a good time for people to maybe talk with their um, tax advisor about their plans, their financial plans and their tax plans for, for the year? I mean, is now a good time to, to start it or probably not waiting until the end of the year or right before June? Yeah, again, that's, that's a good, good question. Um, you're going to find a lot of professionals are extremely busy as we get to the fourth quarter of the year because that'll all start bunching and bunching and bunching to what can I do, what can I do? So the best time to do tax planning is before the year ends. And that means that the best time to do it is let the accountants get through their busy season of uh, April 15th um, during the uh, latter spring, during the summer months, or um, try to do it uh, before they get busy again with extensions and all that. So um, my, my first reaction would be, uh, late spring, summertime, uh, that would be a place where you can start getting those appointments booked, get a projection for what's going on for the current year, plan ahead for what might be for next year, the what ifs. Most people have actually some idea of what they may wish to do that the professional can help them with. So it might be, I want to increase my retirement contribution. I might want to do some more investing where the financial advisor comes in and says, all right, you know, let's work on a financial or an investment plan for you that works in side by side with the accountant. The, the attorney comes in because right. you need, you have all your estate planning uh, items. Do you have, um, you know, the, the, the life continuation documents, uh, do, do not resuscitate durable power of attorneys, uh, all this, some of this is done more once in a while, but tax planning is something that should be done every year. Mm -hmm. Good. All right, well, we've come to the end of our questions. 
And I want to thank you again for your wonderful presentation and for your expert uh, explanation of all these concepts. Um, so, uh, and I'd like to thank everyone, all the participants for their submissions and their, the, the, uh, for the okay. questions. And um, and yeah, it, thank you for all the great questions you submitted there. Very, very much appreciated. It makes uh, doing this a lot of fun and hopefully uh, you get some inf good information out of it. Good, Jeffrey, that's awesome. So in conclusion, we hope you've enjoyed this webinar and found it useful. Um, we'd love to hear your feedback and your suggestions for future topics. Here is my contact information. If you have further questions or if you're considering a planned gift, please reach out to us. And on behalf of CSUMB, OLLI, and KAZU, thank you for participating in today's webinar.